want to welcome everyone to the uh, advanced ventral hernia uh, repair session. It's really advanced hernia repair session, and because uh, I've thrown in uh, uh, hiatal hernia in this just because it's been such a hot topic and so talked about, and we're uh, glad to have uh, Nat Soper you know, come in and, uh, and talk about that uh, and, and the, the, as part of this. We're going to start off with uh, Morris Franklin. Morse has been a leader in, uh, in hernia repair, and, and, and honestly, he's been a leader in laparoscopy, been a leader in, in colon rectal surgery. He's made a huge stamp in, uh, uh, in surgery in the country and also in around the world. And you know, I just want to uh, one, thank Morse for helping me put this program together. And then secondly, you know, this, you know, it's little things like what he's going to talk about uh, today, uh, where he has essentially changed this, this thing that he's done. He's changed the way we do surgery in America, and it has caught on, lit up a little bit with his fellows, kind of spread across the country and now you, you hear people and see people showing videos of the of the Morris Franklin technique of closing the ventral hernia uh, during a uh, laparoscopic ventral hernia repair. Morris, thank you very much. Todd, you're way too kind. I'm, I'm really just a poor country boy trying to get by and trying to do what needs to be done to make our patients do better. Uh, I am going to talk about a reapproximation of the midline. I guess this is a, a a standard and a, a concept that goes back since uh, we started doing ventral and abdominal uh, wall hernia repairs, that is reestablishing live tissue. Um, there are certain instances where we can't do that, but the vast majority of the time for the hernias that most of us see that, that are not in a real high-powered hernia uh, referral center, uh, this is certainly uh, doable, doable uh, things. These are my industry relationships. None of, the, none of the things we're talking about here uh, will be um, uh, included or are or, or a part of any of those relationships. I start off with this uh, saying by Henry Royce, uh, and I'm, I'm, for those of you that can't read Latin, this says, whatever is done is rightly done is noble. And that's certainly true for um, laparoscopic surgery. It doesn't make any difference how simple you do it if you do it right it's going to be noble and it's going to work out better. And there's a lot of different ways to, to do this. I have to uh, tell you a story, and some of you in the audience probably recognize this gentleman who's considerably taller than me. Um, he gave me the first lesson in hernia repair. He gave it to me not because I was a surgeon, not because he was a surgeon, but because he taught me the value of being humble. And I think being humble in hernia repair is incredibly important. We can't fix the world, we can't fix every hernia, we have to do the best we can. The gentleman standing next to me is Oscar Robinson. I played basketball against him when I was a freshman in college. He gave me a good dose of humble pie. <laughs> he scored 44 points, I scored none. So this is where I started ventral hernia repair, right here with Oscar Robinson in a little bit different realm. I think that there's no doubt that the laparoscopic repair of ventral incisional hernias is, is, is coming on strong, and I really mean coming on strong. I think it's becoming the stand, standard of care, and certainly the results. When you look at the results in comparative head-on uh, hernias done in, in a similar manner, laparoscopically and open in good, good trials, you see the laparoscopic repairs are really uh, jumping forward. And the reason is that we have low recurrence rates, low complications rates, uh, shortens the hospital stay, and the, the most important thing is that it reduces, uh, um, it reduces infection. There are certain things that are common to all of the large series, and I think we owe Carl LeBlanc a lot because he was the first one to describe this, but there's been other people that have described different techniques and have really helped us along the way. And that is, and uh, well, this is one of the problems I see with younger surgeons. They say, well, here's the defect. Let's fix it and run. Uh, kind of reminds me of a story of, of, of some bulls and things that I can tell you later. <laughs> but, but this, one of the things that's really important is complete dissection of the entire abdominal wall. If you don't do that, you're going to miss a hernia. And you're going to get to come back, and then you're going to have that humble pie served to you again. Maybe by, not by Dr. Mr. Robinson, but maybe by a lawyer. Um, I think we have to have a thorough exploration to rule out other, other pathology. 
We needed to reduce the hernia contents. We can't fix it with the contents still there. We need to tailor our mesh so some kind of way we've got to measure how big the defect is and decide how much overlap we're going to have. Even if we're going to close the defect, we still need an overlap. Then we have to figure out how we're going to do it with abdominal wall fixation, either staples, sutures, glue, or other things that are coming down the, pack, or the pike. And then I'm a great believer in transfascial fixation, and I think it really is probably mandatory for the larger, larger hernias for sure. All of what we do is based on Pascal's law. And Pascal's law says that the pressure is equal in the entire area, regardless whether it's a small area or a large area, the pressure is equal. And this is a good example of Pascal's law here. So if we don't close the defect, we're very proud of ourselves when we get through with our surgery, and we look at this and say, look how great this is. What does it look like a year later? Not too good. And it's not because the surgery wasn't done correctly. It's because this defect tends to drift a little bit, although uh, certainly uh, Dr. Ramshaw has some, some data contrary to this. But the, many times this will drift apart, and now the mesh will pull into the defect. There's not a hernia but the patient feels a bulge and does not like it. If we close the defect and close it with sutures, then we can see that Pascal's law tends to work a lot better, and now we're not going to have this bulge if it, if it holds, and we can talk about that in discussion if you'd like. If this holds, then we're probably not going to have another defect that comes there, and we're not going to have that bulge that all of us fear after a laparoscopic repair. So what's the rationale of deflect closure? One is to reestablish viable tissue in the midline, provide a lattice upon which mesh can be placed, and this was my original concept, that I didn't care if it stayed together. All I wanted was something to hold the mesh to keep it from bulging until we had good fixation. Maybe we can reduce the subcutaneous dead space, and certainly we can put wider patches of mesh because now we have a greater surface area to put these, this mesh on. This promotes good tissue and growth into, an, into the entire surface. We, I think, and others, that it improves overall, overall outcome with lower recurrence rate, lower seroma rates, and improvement of body image. Now, body image is... You know, say, you know, what difference does it make to a 300-pound lady with a body image? Well, it makes a lot of difference to her. She's got a bulge there. She's not going to be happy, and she's going to go see someone else. So why do seromas occur? We don't know. But there's a lot of studies out there that are showing that the dead space probably has something to do with it. And with open technique, we almost always leave the dead space, even if we cut down the excess skin. Uh, and if we do a laparoscopic technique without closing the defect, we're still creating this dead space. But if we kind of pull this together as we're closing it, particularly if you use percutaneous uh, techniques to close it, this pretty much eliminates the dead space, and we'll see some results of that in a little while. So the technique is the same, insufflation, port placement, lines of adhesions, estimation size of the defect. Then the design of the mesh, as we've already talked about, introduction of the mesh, and I, and I think we're going to see a lot of changes in this area in the near future. I think we're going to see better ways of introduction of the mesh. One of the things that I stress at my place is that I don't want that mesh to ever touch the skin for any reason. So I want some way of putting it in that I can keep it from touching the skin. One of the difficult things is orientation, and certainly uh, Dr. Henniford uh, Bowler and Park came up with some good suggestions for this. Uh, I chose to do a different route, which I'll show you. Uh, we can fix the mesh with staples or transfascially or both. We, uh, we need to reevaluation of the mesh, reevaluate the mesh and the um, intra-abdominal contents after we get through. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that if you've got a fold or if you've got an area that's not tacked down because you didn't go back and look at it or you've pulled on it, pulled on it, tugged on it, and now you've got a... a, a flap hanging down, that's an invitation for disaster. Mr. Robinson's going to visit you again. You're going to get a little more humble pie because you're going to be back. And th then we tr always try to close our ports, take care of the skin incisions, and the hospital care after which everyone is familiar with. So the closure defect is standard, uh, similar to the standard laparoscopic ventral hernia repair. 
we put a small incision over the defect to pass the suture. If it's a huge defect, we may have to put two or three small incisions. Small incisions means half a centimeter or less. We orient and pass our sutures. We decide whether we're going to do it horizontally or ventrically or, or vertically. And since you're in Texas, I will quote Tom Landry and says, I'm going to take what the defense will give me. Same way here. As we're closing this, do we want to close it vertically or horizontally? I'm going to take what the, what the patient is going to give me. We place our sutures, and we'll show you that in just a moment. We lower our neuromal peritoneum somewhere around 6. You say, well, why don't you lower it to 0? Again, humble pie time. Because if you lower it to zero, every once in a while you get a loop of bowel up in there and you get to tie that loop of bowel down. It's real embarrassing when you look again to see that you haven't done it exactly right. Then we reinsufflate to 10 or 12 and we place our mesh. So this is the way we set our trocars up like everyone else pretty much laterally. We almost always start with a various needle at Palmer's Point and then work around taking adhesions down and placing additional trocars as they're needed. And this is this is just showing. Get it to work. This is just showing uh, uh, kind of my typical patient, a little bit on the uh, plump side, uh, and just shows some of the principles of of how we have to kind of be gentle. Uh, I prefer to take fat out first if I can, non dilated bowel second, and then dilated bowel third. And this is what it looks like as we're clo closing this defect. And you say, well, Franklin. You know, you're cheating. This is just a small defect. Actually, this is about an 8 to 9 centimeter in diameter uh, defect. And we put enough sutures in, placed 1 to 2 to 3 centimeters apart, depending on the patient, right at the edge of this firm area that then will hold a suture as we pull it together. And I can already see the faces in the crowd saying, ah, you just violated one of the rules, Doc. You, you're closing it under tension. There's no doubt about that. I agree with you 100%. It is being closed under tension. But if we put a mesh in there to support it, it's okay. I'll show you why it's okay in just a second. This again is just showing reduction of hernia contents, I hope. There we go. Um, and again, um, you can't fix these. And believe it or not, I've actually reviewed cases where people have tried to fix these hernias and didn't reduce the contents. So that, that, that should be a given, but absolutely, again, Mr. Robinson's there on your shoulder giving you some humble pie that if you don't do it. I use cautery uh, for severe adhesions. If there's bowel or anything else around, we, don't, we use no, absolutely no uh, energy sources at all. This is showing, again, the defect closure from the outside, and again, we're just, we just have a small hernia for demonstration purposes, and I can tell you that even if I've got a 1.5, 1.2 centimeter umbilical defect, I'm still going to close it. And this just, show, we like to start beyond the defect. Our common suture, this is a little bit older tape. This tape used uh, Tycron. We now use P, uh, uh, PDS. I think it's a better uh, suture for that, and I don't care if it goes away in a while. This, again, is just showing motion from the outside orient the, the Carter Thomason suture passer, get through sometimes what is relatively tough uh, tissue, and then just pull it back on the outside and keep it oriented like we used to do with a standard McVeigh repair, and th this enables you to keep your suture straight. It's very important not to have these sutures crossed. So if you can lay them in, a, in an organized manner, one, two, three, four, five, not one, three, two, six, something like that, if you can lay, lay them in an organized manner and they're not crossed, then they'll, they'll go down much better, and that's the voice of experience. <clears throat> then we prepare our mesh, and again, Todd and Guy Voller and, and uh, Professor Parks all described a nice way of doing this ramshaw by putting sutures at each corner. I, I chose to do another way, and that is to, to make a slit so that I can orient it. And I put a slit at the top and the bottom, and I get that's my midline slit. And then I put a solitary chromic in the middle, uh, or sometimes two or three chromics if it's a very large mesh as, such as this is, and I'll use this just to pull it up. So this gives me one or two or sometimes three extra hands. Okay, I'm going to hurry up here and, and we'll just skip our data. So this is where we put our mesh in. I'm going to go ahead and uh, skip past this. 
shows put it, putting the, the mesh in place, uh, the kind of staples you don't want to, uh, it doesn't probably really make a lot of difference. Uh, in large defects, we close as much as possible. Sometimes we can't close it all. Put the mesh carefully once inside of the abdomen, make a slit in one side to orient it as we've already talked about it. You can do this in contaminated fields. Uh, we like to use biologicals in a contaminated field, and you can see a biological being used here. Same principle. Um, we have fairly extensive experience with this and are very happy with this, this particular type of, of repair. Just looking at a little bit of the results, you can see that our seroma rate is 3%. Our recurrence rate is 2.9%. This is just uh, dry, uh, graphically showing the same thing. I'm going to run through these fairly quickly. I can always talk to you about it later. As far as postoperative analgesia, with open surgery, there's a moderate. With conventional laparoscopic surgery, not closing the defect, there, this has the lowest amount of pain post-op, but the partial closure also is, is very manageable. Uh, body image uh, satisfaction is great. Um, so I would like to uh, close by telling you that uh, every great, uh, truly great accomplishment, and I'm not claiming that this is, is first deemed to be impossible. That's a Chinese pro proverb, and I appreciate you very much for your attention.